Today we're going to discuss Chapter 6, Osseous Tissue and Skeletal Structure. We'll talk about the functions of the skeletal system, classification of bones, and bone structure. The skeletal system includes the bones, cartilages, ligaments, and other connective tissue. Bones work together with muscles to maintain body position and to produce controlled movement. The skeletal system has five main functions. The first is support. Bones offer the structural support for the entire body. They provide the framework for the attachment of soft tissues. Bones also provide leverage. Bones act as levers that change the magnitude and the direction of the forces generated. Bones offer protection. The ribs, the skull, the vertebrae, and the pelvis all protect very valuable internal organs. Bones also provide storage of minerals and lipids. Calcium phosphate ions are stored in bone and the yellow marrow in the medullary cavity of the bone stores fat cells for energy. Bones also produce blood and blood cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and other elements are produced in the red bone marrow. We classify bones according to their shapes. Here we see several different bone shapes sutural bones, irregular bones, short bones, flat bones, long bones, and sesamoid bones, and we'll discuss each one of these. First, long bones. Long bones are longer than they are wide. Some examples of long bones are the femur, which is in the upper thigh, and the humerus, which is in the upper arm. The next bone shape are the short bones. The short bones are roughly equal in length as they are in width. Short bones can be found in the wrist, as in the carpal bones, and in the foot, as in the tarsal bones. The next bone shape are flat bones. Flat bones are thin and broad. Several examples of flat bones are the skull bones, as well as the ribs and the shoulder blade, which is called the scapula and the sternum, which is the breastbone. Next we have irregular bones. These have complex shapes. Here we see a vertebra. We can see how complex the shape is. This end of the bone looks very different from the other end of the bone. Next we have the sesamoid bones. These are small, flat, and shaped like a sesame seed. The patella bone is one example of the sesamoid bone. The pisiform bone close to the wrist is another bone that is also a sesamoid bone. The last classification of bones is the sutural bones, otherwise known as the wormian bones. They're small, flat, irregularly shaped bones between the flat bones of the skull. Their borders are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, and they range in size from a grain of sand to as wide as a quarter, and they fill in the gaps between the sutures in the skull in between each of the flat bones of the skull. It will be important for you to look at this table which shows the bone markings. Throughout this chapter and throughout the unit on the bone we will talk about these anatomical terms and you need to know their definitions. All of these terms are terms that you will hear when we are talking about structures found on bones and you will find all of those terms on your lab list as well. You should know what their definitions are because if you know what their definitions are then you will be able to easily ascertain what anatomical structure we're looking at. For instance, a process means any projection or a bump, whereas a tuberosity means a smaller rough projection and a tubercle means a small rounded projection. You're going to hear all of these terms including a fossa which means a shallow depression and a sulcus, which means a narrow groove. You'll also hear the word sinus, which means a chamber within a bone normally filled with air. And you will be hearing more of these terms as well, so make sure that you take a look at all these anatomical terms and you understand what their definitions are. Now we're going to take a look at bone structure. Here we have an example of a long bone, and over here we have an example of a flat bone. So we will take a look at the long bone first. The long bone has several different structures on it or areas on it. 
the epiphysis is the area that is expanded at each end of the bone. So there's an epiphysis on this end and there's also an epiphysis on this end and we can see how the bone expands. Those areas are called the epiphysis. We also have the long shaft of the bone and this shaft of the bone is called the diaphysis. And lastly we have the area where the diaphysis meets the epiphysis in this narrowed region which is called the metaphysis. So we see this on this end and we also see the metaphysis on this end. In the flat bone we don't have the diaphysis. Instead we have the cortex of the bone on both sides and in the middle of the bone then we have a spongy bone which is also called the diplole. All bone tissue is called osseous tissue. There are two different types of bone. There's compact bone and spongy bone. Compact bone is very dense bone it's relatively solid and it's located on the surface of bone. So we can find compact bone all on the surface of the bone. Spongy bone on the other hand is more cancellous. It has a network of bony plates and struts so it's not quite as dense or solid and that's going to be located interiorly. In the center of the bone we have a cavity. That cavity is called the medullary cavity. It's the central space in the diaphysis. On either end of the bone, where the bone will articulate with another bone, we have the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage is made up of hyaline cartilage, and this covers the epiphyses. Spongy bone within the epiphyses of long bones, such as the femur, and the interior of other large bones, such as the sternum and ilium, is what's called the red bone marrow. So again, this is found in the epiphyses, of long bones like the femur and the humerus as well in larger flat bones such as the sternum which is the breastbone and the ilium which is in the pelvis. There's also yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow can be found in other bones and the yellow bone marrow contains adipose tissue which is important as an energy reserve. What's interesting is that yellow bone marrow in certain pathological conditions can actually convert to red bone marrow because red bone marrow is where the blood cells are formed. And in pathological conditions such as leukemia, if the red bone marrow isn't producing the blood cells, the yellow bone marrow will convert to red bone marrow and produce the blood cells. In the next segment, we'll talk about the characteristics of bones, the cells of bones, and the difference between compact bone and spongy bone.